Hi everyone. Today we are going to talk about diffusion models. If you have been using Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, Wiscom, Runway, Dolly, actually these systems are all trained by using diffusion systems. All right, so these are pretty much generative AI systems and they use uh, diffusion models uh, to be trained. So uh, this is an image that was generated by using Midjourney version 5 that was released potentially uh, three to six months ago. Uh, so this image was shocking because the models was much better than the previous versions. Uh, if you look at it, you're going to see that it's pretty good in rendering a cat, let's say, uh, but also it's pretty powerful in capturing the photographic qualities of, let's say, light, depth of field, and so on and so forth. So the question is, how does an AI system really know about these things? How does it know what a cat is and how can it really replicate um, photographic uh, qualities uh, of cameras, right? So now we're gonna kind of like learn about that. So these models are all trained by using large data sets, right? So if we were to teach an AI system, let's say what a cat is, you have to feed a lot of cat pictures. We talked about that in the previous lesson when we were discussing style, uh, the S scans, or, you know, like personally style scans. So here uh, you see a system which is putting images and labels together, right? So let's say we are trying to teach the system what a French cat is. Well, it's beyond a cat. The system knows to know the cat. And then we're trying to identify or label some images by using French cat. So uh, this is a hard task, right? Because again, the images, let's say the 10 images we see here, wouldn't be enough for an AI system to, to figure out that a French cat is a cat that has, you know, let's say a hat and, you know, a t-shirt with uh, stripes. So you would need a lot more pictures to, to train uh, such a system. And also you need to do a lot of more labeling, right? Kind of like attaching the notation, the description of the image to the image itself. So it's a pretty huge task. So that is when large scale artificial intelligence open network comes into play. This is an open source foundation that collected millions and then billions of images and then organized them and then labeled them and they stored them. This is available for downloading. Of course, it wouldn't fit into a conventional, you know, desktop, desktop or laptop because the size is hundreds of terabytes large. Uh, but actually, you can go and, you know, uh, let's say search images and use them uh, for uh, training diffusion models. So one interesting thing that happened last year was um, after releasing the 400 million image data set a couple of years ago now, uh, Leion released a 5.85 billion uh, data set. Uh, for the um, AI, for AI training, pretty much. And it's a big jump because uh, if, you, if you have more data, if you create them in a better way, meaning removing the redundant images and only keeping the good ones, and then if you label them properly, meaning you use the natural language in the best way possible to uh, write descriptions for your images, actually you can get the best results out of your system. So that was a big step. And again, uh, I think Leon uh, made uh, it possible for a lot of AI companies to uh, train their uh, own uh, diffusion models. And again, by number, which is not really high because it's a huge task uh, to train a diffusion model from scratch. All right. So where uh, do these images come from and how many of those these um, beyond tools are using so mid-journey version 2 and version 3 potentially they use 2 billion images so that was already a huge data set their images were better from compared to dolly at some point they were more realistic they were more artistic at some point because uh because of a couple of reasons potentially one was the number of images that were being used uh, the second thing was about, of course, the curation potentially was more intentional, meaning Midjourney really wanted to be artistic, right? So they selected and created the images that way. 
whereas maybe Dolly was not that careful about picking the images. And then Mid Journey did a great job in um, labeling and uh, annotating that data, right? So that that information that was embedded with the with the image data set was really really good. Uh, so Stable Diffusion used two billion images in their former smaller uh, model, and they released the X Large XL STXL uh, almost like three months ago now potentially. Uh, which is a larger model, and it's using, uh, of course, um, a, a larger data set. So let's say if anybody was to go and, you know, um, train their own uh, stable diffusion model, potentially they would use this uh, 5 billion, 5 plus billion image data set. So where do these images come from? So if the, um, the company that is doing the AI training is large enough, they can... You know, if they have the power, they can go and scrape the internet themselves. Let's say Google can write a code. Now they already have all like a lot of images on their servers, so servers, so they can scrape the internet, get all these images, classify them, label them, and so on and so forth. Interestingly, Stable Diffusion uh, used the images from these sources, and you can see that of course the balance is different, right? So 8.6% came from Pinterest. 6.8 came from WordPress and so on and so forth, even from Sh Shopify, right? Like product images. And they were potentially were classified, created, selected, and labeled, meaning description was written uh, for all those images and so on and so forth. So this is important because the other models probably use other resources or they had different ingredients, different percentages of these, um, these image resources or image types meaning they already had a bias towards making different sorts of images. In a second ago, I said Mid Journey has always been more artistic and potentially it's, it's because they used more uh, arts, you know, um, related images like pictures of uh, or scans of paintings, sculptures, and so on and so forth. And tra they trained the model with that kind of, and let's say, eye, whereas maybe other models were not... Uh, Kind of like had the tendency to do that or they were they were using equally kind of like large data sets uh, so uh, they were yielding different sorts of results depending on what you were trying to get let's look into now how a diffusion models work we know that you can write a text prompt get an image we know that you can put an image and get an image and so on and so forth so text the image and image the image models uh, methods can be used or you can use them in tandem there's an interesting step which is called like add noise here uh, and then after you add noise to an image it apparently goes into something called unit right and then something happens there and then after the decoder uh, renders an image for you actually this is a diagram that I drew for you because the diagrams were uh, on online uh, or on papers are either too confusing or they don't have enough information uh, to reveal what really happens under the hood in stable diffusion. So there are two important points here. One is the add noise, like why a system would add noise to an already existent image is a question. And then what, what is UNET really? We're gonna talk about that. Actually, that's the black box uh, the trained AI model in which, you know, like the magic really happens. So let's talk about UNET first. UNET is a convolutional neural network that's, uh, for, that's used for image segmentation. It was first used for uh, in the biomedical image segmentation, meaning, you know, when you look into a CAT scan uh, to, let's say, differentiate tissue from organs and, so, and bones and so on and so forth, and then uh, later it was used in GIS, for instance, in, in this example, you're seeing uh, like the, the roads and the buildings and the water is being segmented. So I talked about age detection, remember, in the previous class. So this is going a, a step uh, forward and beyond the edges. It's also trying to label what each pixel in the picture is so you can make a segmentation. So that's what you know, UNET's duty is, but then UNET started being used uh, for pretty much, you know, like diffusion models uh, within the recent years. 
And let's see what adding noise is. So adding and removing noise to images is the primary method in stable diffusion training, okay? Uh, what happens is that um, the system adds noise to an image and then it tries to figure out what noise was added and then tries to remove the noise and then come up with a picture. That's why in a image to image system, for instance, if you're using image to image model, uh, image to image method in the stable diffusion model, let's say you put again like a cat image and you get a cat image again, it looks like the first image depending on how proximal you want to be, but also it's slightly different. So what it happens there is it adds noise to the original image, makes it obscure, so it looks like barely like a cat. And because it already knows what a cat is, it starts removing that noise. So then you get that, you know, like sim similar image and so on and so forth. So this is how the diffusion process happens. You begin with a clean input image and introduce noise, transforming it into a more obscure noisy image. And then feed the noisy image into UNET, okay? UNET, a denoising autoencoder, uh, and then it will try to understand, right, uh, predict and identify the specific noise that was added to the image. If it gets really good in determining what noise was added, then it gets actually better in creating, you know, the intended image uh, in a better way. Through iterative training, uh, you improve the unit's ability to accurately predict the noise, which is, you know, like what I said a second ago. And as the unit proficiency grows, it becomes more skilled at generating clean images from the noisy data. And then you utilize the unit's noise handling and manipulation capabilities to enhance the diffusion process, which systematically adds and then removes noise to, the, uh, to craft new images, right? So that's pretty much all the story of the diffusion model. Add noise, remove noise, add noise, remove noise, and then Again, a unit that's becoming super, super skilled in adding and removing noise to the system. All right. So this is a verbal description, you know, um, kind of the system. But I also sat and wrote. So you can go and uh, review and understand the system in a better way. I have a couple of simple examples uh, in this article. Uh, which I'm hoping will be will make um, the process of training diffusion models cl crystal clear in your mind. Again, as a designer, you don't have to know the super savior technical computational side of things, but this is extremely useful for understanding how the system works. And once you have a better grasp of it, you will use this system in a better way. And in the future, if somebody asks you to use the systems, it will be you training a custom model by using this these systems, right? It's not going to be, hey, make a cat picture for me. It's going to be, hey, make a system that is able to generate uh, this or that kind of like, you know, car models, automotive designs, shoe designs, building designs, right? So having an edge on understanding these systems is very important so you, so you can use them to your utmost benefit and understanding one of the last things that i want to talk about is we talked about gans in the last class right so that was invented in 2014 and i think the first implementation was made in 16. and then we talked about diffusion models today which was you know, implemented in 2020, and that actually it came a long way since then, right? So it's it's the first diffusion models are nothing like what we have today uh, in last three years, which hit, had a huge leap uh, in terms of the power of these uh, tool. There was one older technology, which is the variational autoencoders, that I'm not covering because it's somewhat an outdated um, technology or system, but I have the comparison here and a link uh, where this comparison comes from. So feel free to read about all these three systems and learn about them in depth if you're interested in, let's say, writing a master's thesis or PhD thesis 
uh, that is related to generative AI. You need to know about all these three systems. So uh, you can make strong persuasive ar arguments in what you're trying to do. One last note. So potentially, you know, the artwork on the left side, which says this is not a pipe, right? In French. Uh, this is from Magritte. Uh, it's pretty decently old artwork, which is to say an image of a pipe is not a pipe, right? And even now we are looking at an image which is in conventional manners. It's not an artwork. It's a, just a digital representation that I'm recording now. And on the right side, I did a pipe with probably Mid Journey version 3 or 4. So, and I said this is not a pipe either. We shouldn't confuse image making with designing. That's why these classes are concentrating on uh, in-depth knowledge about computational design, about AI, uh, about generating designs, artwork, images, and so on and so forth. So creation is great. Creating is great. But knowing is super, super important. However, in the next class, actually, I'm going to talk about how to best utilize these tools because these tools may end up giving you random results or you can be very intentional and, it, and get great results uh, depending on uh, what your intention is, what you're trying to get. So I'll see you in the next one.